had a long day? Join RB in the cheap seats where the beer tastes better and the games always matter. Settle down. Settle down. Everyone get quiet. Get, get, in your, get in your seat and get comfortable. Got another edition of the Cheap Seats for you here on this Friday afternoon. And back via popular request, in insanely popular request, head coach Tony Robichaux of the Raging Cajuns baseball program. And Tony, last week I had you on for the first installment of a little summer series I wanted to call Making a Man. And I wasn't sure how people were going to react or, or what they were going to say, but I've had people in the coaching world ask me if I could send them links to the interview so they could play it for their young men and things like that. So we've decided to take up a part two here. And I, I asked you a question off air last time after we got done about toughness and, and how hard it is to raise kids tough in today's modern climate. We're going to get into that in just a second, but the first thing I wanted to ask you is going back to your beginning of your story. I asked you about where you kind of learned your lessons and your ethics and your values, and you brought up the fact that your father was a butcher. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever things would go astray in your family, you guys would get sent to the slaughterhouse. <laughs> that's, that's one way. That's yeah. one way to teach you what, what right and wrong is. Can you, can you remember any of, the, any of the times whenever you did get sent to the slaughterhouse? Because that'll be a way to teach you a couple lessons. I didn't, I, well, I didn't get sent many times after the first couple because <laughs> you, 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 you figured that one out. You know, um, It helped us decide, you know, I, I think I need to get to college and get a degree and you know, everything else because working in the slaughterhouse in the summer um, – was was not fun no no can you can you remember any time where you were specifically just like i'm done with this oh I'm yeah done. sure sure after the after i think the first time i went in there <laughs> so if if you own a slaughterhouse or if you're a butcher just know that if your kids need discipline just put them to work just <laughs> just put them to work i found that interesting though because i feel like a lot of a lot of your generation's toughness came from their parents yeah uh my grandfather worked on the railroad built his own house with his bare hands and then still played minor league ball in his off season, and it's just I, I feel like that breed of individual, that breed of man and woman. My, my grandmother, we called her powerful Katrinka. She had bigger biceps than than my father, but it's I, I feel like a lot of that comes down generationally. And is is that where you got a large part of your toughness was from your father and your parents? Oh, there's no doubt. You know, we 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 had we had five boys in the family, and it was go outside and play. We lived about eight miles out of Crowley. My mom was a saint, you know. She she only drove a, a station wagon. She never knew there was any other kind of car. <laughs> and uh, she hauled five boys to Little League during the summer. We, My dad never made us ride the bus. My, my mom took us to school every day. But it was eight miles into Crowley and eight miles out. And, and she's a saint uh, because, you know, Timmy and I were twins. And, and we stayed in the same league together. But Troy was underneath us and then Jody and then Michael. So uh, she constantly, during the summer, was we were headed to the ballpark. I mean, um, somebody was playing, you know. And I tell this to people all the time, you know, a chili frito pie or a pickle, um, that's steak to our family because that's all we knew. You know, we ate at the ballpark every night. And so she brought us back and forth and back and forth. And then, um, you know, he, he, he had a hard job. I mean, he had to get up every morning at 5 o'clock and stand on his feet every day in the meat market in Crowley and, to raise five boys and uh he'd get home every afternoon and we'd be waiting outside to play baseball and he'd get out of that truck with that old brown paper bag with some baseballs in it you know and for years you know i i never knew how hard that was because we had so much energy waiting on him and when when it turned the corner and then all of a sudden i got home at night from a from a game or a long practice i had two boys and a daughter waiting to maybe go outside and play catch and there were many nights, you know, I, I wanted to say I'm, I'm too tired, you know, and um, then it brought back how tough that was for him. And, and, and so it was, a, you know, every Father's Day, you know, I try to tell him, you know, how, how, how I understand now how hard that was, you know, to get home every night and then pull that bag out and throw to five boys, you know, that waiting to play baseball. And so, um, you know, we'll be, ever be indebted to him for the time he gave us when he got home. And then 
and 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 for us for the toughness, it's just it's just kind of that was the way it was. Like we lived eight and a half miles out of Crowley, so during the summer, he'd come home every day for about eleven o'clock or eleven thirty for lunch, and his other brother would cover the meat market. Then he would go back after he ate and rest, and his brother would go home for his lunch. And we'd, we, he'd let us put our bikes in the back of his truck, and we'd ride into Crowley when he'd go back, you know, at about 12.30 or 1. And the meat market shut down, I think, at 5 or 5.30. So he, he allowed us, when we hit the meat market in Crowley, you know, in South Crowley, we all took off. I mean, we were going to Bayou Bend to meet the Nichols or – uh, we were going to find our friends at a park to play basketball or baseball or something, you know. And, man, you knew at 530, you know, you better be back at the meat market because <laughs> it was getting left. It was an eight-mile ride <laughs> on that bicycle on Highway 13 heading to Kaplan. And so you didn't want that ride. Oh. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But, but today, you know, some parent could look like they're crazy for making their kid ride eight miles, you know? Oh, why'd you do that? It might rain. Exactly. They might get wet. So, What's so, going to happen to the chain on their bike? But, but you know, <laughs> what we've what we got to watch out for is our youth. They kind of like a kite. <clears throat> we might have covered this in the first segment. I don't know. But a kite can't get off the ground, as I tell parents, without turbulence. The greater the turbulence, the higher the kite flies. And I just think over time, after generation after generation, you know, in society, we try to try to invent things and do things to make, things either easier or more efficient and then after a while you know the parent looks up they've taken all the turbulence out of the kid's life because sometimes we think that's i love you because i had a lot of turbulence or each parent believes they've had a lot of turbulence so you know what if i can get rid of the turbulence in his life he might have a greater life what we lose uh uh you know the view of it is is that turbulence is what made you great yeah you follow me? Mm-hmm. And the greater the turbulence, it's your chance to be great now. That's what I tell our players all the time, you know, when we hit tough times, is now you get a chance to show somebody who you really are. If you don't have turbulence, how will you ever tell them or show them who you really are? And you can bring a six-year-old out to Cajun Field, you know, with no wind. He'll tell you don't get out of the car. I mean, the kite's not going to fly. But the greater the turbulence, the higher the kite flies. And so sometimes we just have to be careful as parents along the way because it's hard we 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 suffer through our kids suffrage and so because of that we have a tendency to try to take all the suffering away from them but then we look back and and the kite can't get up off the ground and we wonder you know what the problem is today yeah it's it's hard to find your metal if it's never been tested no doubt we'll we'll, we'll put it that way so you can't sharpen a knife with a paper plate or a kleenex no 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 you can't and i know you said it coach babino has said it to me before too the mark of a champion is someone that can bounce back from the mistakes they've made or get a whooping and then come back and make sure you have scar tissue from it to be tougher moving after that. Well, that's what the good Lord wants. You know, he, he, he really demands persistence, not perfection. And that gets us in trouble sometimes. You know, uh, we have this belief that we have to be perfect and we don't. We just have to make progress. That's what he wants us to do. And so we used to have a little thing when the boys of my daughter fell down. In fact, I do it with the grandchildren. Anytime they fall down, none of us go walk towards them. If you ever watch a child when he's little, you know, he'll fall down and he won't cry yet. He'll look around. And mm-hmm. as soon as somebody's See parents' reaction. As soon as somebody moves towards him, he starts to cry. And, you know, and so would we try to, we had a little thing that we call, you know, get back up, you know. And so when they fall, you know, we'll wait for him and we'll tell him, you know, hey, get back up. Because in life, that's what's going to have to happen. You're going to have to be able to, and, and you know what, people, I tell the players this all the time, you know, when you fall, you have to get back up inwardly, you know. Not, not externally. And that's what happens a lot of times when we fall. We start to look outward instead of looking inward. And, and, and to me, that's how you have to get back up. You have to get back inwardly. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you just said that because that you brought me right to a question I have on this sheet. Can toughness be taught? Can it, can it be taught or, or preached or installed in someone, or does it kind of have to come from within from that own person? Well, I think eventually you, you're going to be in charge of your toughness, okay, to be able to make it. But I think our environment is what creates our toughness. And I think if you go get a kid from a, a very tough neighborhood, we, we talk about this all the time. Sometimes you see a pack of Skittles hanging in our bulletin board in our locker room, and the players know what that means, you know. We, you, you take a, a nine-year-old from a very, very tough, rough neighborhood and uh, that has nothing, and then you bring him into the locker room, and then you bring another nine-year-old from maybe entitlement uh, from, from a real very, very, very wealthy neighborhood, and then you put those two in that locker room, and you throw one pack of Skittles in there, and you say, hey, y'all go get them. You know, I'm going to tell you who's coming out with them Skittles. 
because the other one, he has a backup plan. You know, mom or dad will buy it for me if I don't get it, so why should I have to fight for it? You know, this this other nine-year-old, though, he's got no backup plan. He don't know where his next meal's coming from, so he's he's going to fight for those Skittles. And and, and that's, that's coming from the environment that he was in, you know? And we talk about that all that time. You know, you put a plant in a closet, it doesn't commit suicide, but the environment that it gets put in either stunts its growth, enhances its growth. And so I think environment, it comes back to environment. I think uh, the modeling, um, who's doing the teaching, who's doing the modeling, uh, because we we got another thing we tell the players all the time. If you take a, a 15, 16-year-old kid and you fly him out to an offshore drilling platform, you know, and put him on the deck and bring everybody out, he's going to stick out like a sore thumb. But come back and get him a year later and then put everybody on the deck and then look for him, it's going to be harder to recognize him because he's going to start to become what his environment is. And and that's a good thing if you're in a good environment and a tough environment, and then it can be bad if you're in a soft environment. And it can also be bad if you're in a, in a real bad environment. you you got to fight now not to become what that environment's trying to make you also. So I, I, I do believe, believe that it, it's a, it's a, it's, it can be trained and instilled, but, but it's going to come through some heartache and some pain. And, and, and I, I think somewhere in there you're going to have to dig deep because we talk about AIT all the time that we wear in our bracelets, and that's attitude, approach, intensity, and toughness. And we talk about it all the time. The last T is the toughest one to give. That's, that's toughness because toughness is who you are in the midst of adversity. It's not who you are when things are going good. And that's where people earn their salt is the people that are good when things are going bad. Yeah. And like, I have, I have a friend of mine who were the same age, graduated the exact same time I went to college. He went offshore and started working on a rig and sure. everything. And there's just, I'll admit there's, there's a slight gap in the, stuff, in the stuff he's comfortable with no doubt. and the stuff I'm comfortable with. Sure. And you're right. Sometimes you got to be thrown in that fire to, to get forged. And last one on you, Coach, before we, we transition, we'll take a break and come back. But I said toughness. You said a lot of it came from your parents, seeing the way they worked, the way they handled themselves. I have to imagine part of it came from being one of five brothers, too. I had, I had one brother who was older than me, and I, I've always thanked him throughout my entire athletic career and everything else because I said it was almost impossible for someone to, to break me. Like, I, I played football. I'd get tackled. My mom would cry and worry, think I was dead, but I'd get right back up because sure. I had brothers. Sure. Was that part of it for you, too? Oh, there's no doubt. And, and, and you know, in today's society, too, you know, you went out and played. You know, oh, yeah. I mean, you went out and played. And, and, uh, and I think there's some value to that, you know. And um, at our house, eight miles out of Crowley, you had no friends unless they were somebody was sleeping over and and you had to get up that morning and me and Timmy and Troy and Michael and Jody you had to go find a game outside and you know that lasted about 20 minutes and the fighting began you know <laughs> i mean so so you know that was that was our 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 mornings our days you had to get up and get outside you didn't have the computer you didn't have a lot of video games back then and you had to get outside and today it's a shame but you can drive to our parks today and there's no movement in the parks, you there's know. There's no one there. I mean, there's nobody there. We're so scared today that, you know, it's 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 safer, unfortunately, to keep our child in the house and know that he's in that room playing video games. And that's that's you know that's a tragedy. But uh, that that wasn't the way it was just back then. You got up, you went outside. Uh, we lived on about a hundred acres, so we had some four wheelers and some horses and you know, a bayou running down the back of the land. And I mean, we, we, you know, you, you took off. That's you, a boy's playground. Hey, you went, you went, you went do, do the things that you needed to do. And then, and it was a joy when you got in the car to head to town. I mean, that was a big event for us to go eat somewhere or something, you know, cause we were eight and a half miles out of, out of Crowley. Yeah. And I'm, I, I actually have started to see the, the change, really, in just the exposure of kids to outside. Because I used to go around and play with my friends all the time. Like sure. my, I'd go out at about 9, 10 in the morning, come back whenever it was dark, or I'd sometimes have to get a call to go back. And I, I really don't know. I don't know what's happening to that. And we're going to start investigating some of those issues up in the next segment. Tony Robichaux is my guest here in the Cheap Seats, another edition of Making a Man. Whenever we come back, we'll start digging into the question, why has it gotten harder to raise tough children into tough adults. I have a feeling Tony's going to have a lengthy response on this one. Come back.
Y'all know what that song means? It means Tony Robichaux is about to have a conversation. Welcome back into the cheap seats here on ESPN1420.com. Raging Cajun baseball head coach Tony Robichaux is my guest. And Tony, we decided we had to devote an entire episode to this topic because I, I didn't get to fit the question in the first time we talked last Friday. And whenever I told you that I was going to ask you this question, you smiled and you said, oh, this could be an entire episode. So I said, all right, let's do this. And you can take this wherever, wherever you want with it. I have a couple follow-ups, but in your educated opinion, why has it gotten so difficult to raise your kids tough in today's society? Because tough children become tough adults, and that process continues to repeat itself. Why has it gotten so hard to raise kids tough? Well, I think the biggest challenge, like we tell our players all the time, you know, we want to challenge them to live right side up and upside down world. And we give them the example about getting on interstate. You know, if you get on interstate and you head west, and 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 but you get in on the opposite lane at night, okay? Well, immediately people are going to be flashing their their flashers and blowing their horn and everything, trying to turn you back around, because it's easy to see that you're going in the wrong direction. I think the challenge in our society today is we got so many people going in the wrong direction that I don't know. There's nobody helping turn you around because. You don't know really what direction you should be going in. And so the, the biggest challenge today, I think, again, is in society every year, if you look on the cover of magazines on the aisle and the, coming out of the store, you know, you'll see the words on it, you know, five minutes, uh, le- lose 10 pounds and, and by drinking this one drink. Um, you know, you see the word easy, comfort. Um, that's the sell today, you know, the five-minute ab roller. And so... Everything is a sell on trying to do something fast and easy and with no discipline. And, and again, that's a lie. I mean, ultimately, it's a lie. And I told you in the last one, that's why I respect the SEALs so much. You know, the Navy SEALs is that they're an elite group, and, but you have to come elite yourself first. And that's a tough thing to do. I mean, it's easier to just attach yourself to something that's already elite. And I think that's our biggest fight uh, and why it's it's hard to become tough is because the other option is easier. And that's what the sell is today is to do it fast, to do it easy, you know, to do it quick and to do it really with no discipline. And I think we just bought that for so long now that tough coaches are having tougher times to deal with. I think principals and teachers, I think tough teachers are having tougher times to deal with tough, tough issues. I always hope and continue to pray. My wife's a school teacher that, Pray for our principals and pray for the tough teachers and the tough coaches out there because I want my son and my daughter to be taught by a tough teacher. I want my sons to be coached by a tough coach because that's how you get better, you know. And um, we talk about it all the time with our players. We look at a player like a table. He has four legs to that table. He's got an academic leg, a spiritual leg, a social leg, and, and an athletic leg. If I let them come play for me, and I let them just drink in bars and fight and stay out all night and just play baseball, well, then they become a one-legged table. Mm -hmm. And then when life's burdens get put onto their table when they leave me, then that table's not going to hold much. You follow me? Yeah, it's going to collapse. It's going to collapse. So if we got to strengthen all four, is that easy to do? No, it's it's easier. Uh, It's a lot easier just to let him worry about his athletic leg. But, but when we do that, and there's a lot of coaches out there, and a lot of teachers do that, they turn their heads and they write papers for kids and, you know, they fix stuff for the athlete all the way through. That's all they're doing is turning them into a one-legged table, you know, because you never knock the crutches out from underneath his arms and teach him how to walk. I mean, it's hard to walk with crutches. And, and, and I think when you fail to take the tough route, okay, then I think you're putting crutches underneath him. And we, we sometimes, we, like we tell our players, sometimes I come into the first team meeting with them on, with crutches underneath my arms, and I, I put them down. And they ask the coach, you hurt? And I go, no. But I'm just letting you know something today. I'm here today to knock the crutches out from underneath you because if you think you've come here, you know, for me to put a crutch under you, then you, 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 you showed up at the wrong joint. I mean, we're going to knock the crutches out from underneath you and teach you how to walk. And, and there's no way you can teach somebody how to, how to be a climber on a smooth road. That's just tough to do. I mean, pull over somewhere at a rock climbing place and go in and have nothing to climb. I mean, they'd go out of business, right? I mean, you, you need you got to teach them how to be a climber. And, and I remember this one teacher one time called me because we have this belief system. We tell our players, we will not write your papers. We will not fix your speeding tickets. 
uh, slow down. And I applaud you for that. You're not going to fix mine, so why should I fix yours? Um, I'm not going to give you any extra benefits. Um, and 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 uh, the last thing we're going to do is fix a grade for you with a teacher. You know, because see, I don't think they should have any different right than the girl that's working at night. She's pregnant. The 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 father might be a deadbeat dad rolled out on her like a you know tough to find good men today. Mm-hmm. So 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 all of a sudden now. You know, she's going to school, and she's sitting on the side of, say, an athlete. Why should she feel that this guy has a chance to not come to school, sleep in the back of class, and he gets the advantage over me? You know what I'm saying? Oh, no, yeah, that that bothered me a ton when I was in school. Well, and this is what we tell our players all the time. You know, we already have the dumb jock syndrome already because of what gets televised and everything else. We're going to go against that. You know, you're not going to wear a hat on campus. You're not going to wear flip-flops on campus. You're going to get dressed like you're going into the corporate world now. Don't tell me you'll do it five years from now. We're going to do it now. We're going to treat this as the corporate world. You're going to go in dress right. You're going to sit in the first three rows. You're not going to have a hat on. And, 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 and you're going to get in there like it's corporate America because one day you will be in corporate America and you're going to have to show up to work on time. And, 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 and i never forget this one teacher. She called one time and said, Coach Robe, I need to talk to you. Um, we've got a player that, that, you know, potentially has done very bad in class. But, you know, I'm a, I'm a season ticket holder and I love baseball. So I said, okay. So first of all, let me do this. Let's take the season ticket part and, and the, love the baseball part of it out of it because that really has no issue here. Mm-hmm. I said, let's do this. You tell me what he deserves right now in your professional opinion. You tell me what he deserves. She said an F, but I like baseball. I said, okay, here's what we're going to do this. Flunk him. So she went cold silence for a few minutes, you know, and she said, flunk him. I said, well, you just told me that he deserves an F. So if that's what he's earned, we're going to give it to him because if we bail him out with baseball, okay, he's going to keep waiting for the rest of his life to be bailed out. And one day he's going to have a wife and he's going to have children and he can't wait for somebody else to bail him out. You follow me? Oh, yeah. And so, so she was dumbfounded that, you know, he can do extra work. I said, no, he should have done the work that he was supposed to do from the first time. So we want to establish that so that they don't go walking around with, uh, uh, here I am, um, walking into class five minutes late, poorly dressed with, hey, man, uh, you know who I am. Uh, you know, I'm Nick Lee, man. I mean, I, I missed a quiz. I, I think you can 90, make that one you up. know, yeah, fix me up, you know. I mean, that's what happens with athletics along the way sometimes. And that, to me, that's a disservice to turning him into a man. I'm, I'm glad I said that exact point earlier this week. Of course, we had the news in the state of the DA up north that gave the, the athletes a pass, basically, because he said, oh, well, they were out there sweating. They were doing all this. And I honestly, I took that as an insult as, as a kid who – worked really hard in school to have my own opportunity and things. I said, look, if I was sitting somewhere smoking weed with, with a gun in my car or something like that, and I got arrested, my life would be over. It, it would change so fast. So why, what, what makes them any different? Sure. Yeah, what makes them any different? And my question to you about that is I, I feel like people think they're doing them favor. They say, oh, we're going we're gonna to protect their future. We don't want to have them deal with this now You're in the middle them. of their career. You're crippling them. That's what I was going to ask you is, are, are we doing them any favors no. by cutting them these breaks? No, because what they'll do now is what they are doing, being, a, being an athlete, is starting to become who they are. And so now you're starting to teach him that he's going to get a pass. He's going to get a mulligan on who he is. But one day their glory is going to leave them. They will be no longer an athlete, okay? So who's going to continue to fix everything for them, you know? And this is why you see so many athletes, you know, under I-10 when their career's over and squandered so much money. I mean, it's because once they get ready to go out into the real world, they're not prepared for it because the real world doesn't fix stuff for you. When's the last time you've been able to come into work drunk? When's the last time you were able to come into work, you know, three days late? When's the last time you came to work and opened up your laptop drawer and there was a hundred dollar bill in it? I mean, that's not real life. That's not that's not what they're going to go in the face. And I think when you fix stuff for them along the way, you start to show them um, that you know what you, you're going to be able to push through this as being an athlete. 
And then I think that's why athletes, so many of them beat their wives. I think that so many of them in trouble down the road is because along the way, all that gets fixed. And then when they come back to the real world and life's burdens get put back on their table, somebody's allowed them to be a one-legged table. Head coach Tony Robichaux of the Raging Cajun Baseball Program. Our guest right now, we're, uh, we're in part two of Making a Man. Today's topic is, is toughness. And I feel like part of this, too, why it's become so hard to raise tough kids and coach people in a hard, hard way is that whether it's social media or the Internet or whatever it is, it feels like everyone has an opinion on how you are doing something or how you should be doing something or the best way that things are. And it's everyone tries to raise everyone else's kids and everyone else tries to make sure that, oh, how dare you do that? I would never do that. And I feel like that's just complicated the entire process because everyone's, everyone's kids are their own children. Everyone's circumstances are a little bit different. And I, I, ha, I, I do. I feel like it's made things really, really hard because people are scared to crack down because they don't know who might be looking over their shoulder to send a report to somebody. Well, that, that, is, that is a tough thing today because, because of all the social surroundings of everything today. You know, back again, when we grew up, you were living eight miles out of town. If, if she whooped us, uh, we had an eight mile hike to go try to tell somebody. I mean, you know, I mean, we didn't, you couldn't get on a computer or a phone. And, and so, you know, the, the bottom line today is I, I think the parameters that you set, you know, like, like my grandchild's been riding with me to camp in the morning, you know, he's nine. And yesterday, you know, he, he acted up after one of his little baseball scrimmages and, you know, kind of didn't shake the hands of, of a couple of players along the way. He was a little upset maybe or whatever. So guess what? Today he, he's not riding with camp to me. I mean, he's, he can't come to camp. And I told him on the phone when his dad and mom punished him that you need to learn our players shake players' hands after a game. I don't care if you lost. It's good to, it's good to hate to lose but you cannot let it consume you, you know? So he's, he's not coming to camp today, you know? And, and that's a hard thing to do to watch your kid suffer when, he, when, when he's dressed every morning, ready to roll, to be dropped off at my house to go to camp, you know? I mean, he waits for that. He comes to six weeks of camp with me, you know? <laughs> and uh, this morning he didn't come. And I got on the phone and told him, you know, do better, you know, act right. Um, and then maybe you can come to camp tomorrow again, you know? So, but you are right. It is so tough. You know, I see old saying, I'm, I'm okay with change, uh, but you go first. <laughs> um, that's the biggest challenge today is you do have to not look left and right, you know, and, and, and cause I'm not no perfect parent. I mean, you didn't, you're not interviewing me today. We need to get that clear that, you know, because I'm perfect. And no, you, yeah. didn't, you didn't go through the phone book and the peas and find me under perfect. No. Um, we all fight this. Okay. None of us are immune from anything that we're talking about today. And so, uh, but it is tough because you might have two people on the side of you that let their kids stay out all night. And then your child comes in and says, look, they really trust Johnny. No, no, that's not trust. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's stupidity. And and there's a difference between trust because discipline says I love you. Where people get wrong, I think, with discipline, when you step out and become a disciplinarian and one of my players gets in trouble or, or you know, Get, gets in trouble and we decide that we have to punish him for it, people can now throw a stone at you and say, well, I thought you were a disciplinarian. You see, th that's what they do to parents, too, that are disciplinarians. When their child messes up, they try to throw it in their face, well, I thought you were a disciplinarian. See, that's not what a disciplinarian says, is that your child will never make a mistake because you're a disciplinarian. Yeah. What a disciplinarian says is, discipline says, I love you. So discipline says, I will not cover nothing up for you. I will not write your paper for you. If you get a DWI, it's a year suspension. I don't care if somebody thinks that's too difficult or not difficult, but we're not going to come back here and run 14 bleachers and let you back on the baseball team because you're a good athlete because you got a DWI. Let's go talk to a mother against drug driving, and let's see if a year suspension is too tough. Okay? I don't think they'll think it's too tough. Somebody has to break his chain, man. Somebody has to break his chain. And if I'm not willing to do it, and suffer with him, then he's not going to get any better. Because if I don't break his chain now, who will, who, who's going to break his chain? You follow me? Yeah. And if I show him that you can run 14 bleachers and come on back, then, then he believes he gets a mulligan again down the road. You follow me? Yeah, and you don't. No, you don't. And, and do, we need, do we need to kick him out forever? No. It's a, we, we do a one-year suspension, and you show me that, 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 that you think this is enough of a privilege to come back into here because evidently the first time you didn't think it was or you wouldn't be doing what you did. You follow me? Yeah. 
So, so I'm not saying that that policy is the right policy, and I'm not saying <coughs> what I do is always right. We all fight this, this, this thing of trying to raise our child amongst other people sometimes that are doing theirs the way they want. I don't think there's one right way. I just think discipline says I love you. And, 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 I, and I really believe that you, 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 to the best of your ability, you shouldn't hide stuff under the rug or cover it up and, 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 and let, them, let them deal with it, okay? I'll give you an example. My own daughter and them were riding around town one night when they were young in high school, and uh, she, was, she was in the vehicle with somebody else, four or five, six little girls, and they got pulled over, and, and in there they had a nice chest with some beer floating around in it, Uh-oh. right? So, so the way they do it in Crowley is they take you down to the, you know, the, 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 the city hall, whatever, and then you've got to come back with your parents later in, in front of the judge. So we get up one morning. My uncle's a lawyer. He works for Edward Stefanski and Barus. And so my daughter says, you're not going to work this morning? And I said, no, I got an appointment with you. And she said, well, well you can just go on to work because somebody told me that this is just like a, a fake trial they do to, to, to scare us or whatever, and that because Russell's uh, attorney, he can probably get us out of it. I said, nobody's going to get us out of this. I said, you're going to learn this morning that when you make decisions, you're gonna you're, there's accountability, and I said you're gonna also learn that you affect everybody else around you when you make those decisions because now I have to go up there, and so I said I'm gonna tell you this when we go in front of that judge whether it's fake or not I'm telling you this you buckle a kneecap on me you you palm him you roll your eyes you shrug your shoulders they're gonna arrest me right there for child abuse, so we're gonna walk into there together. And we're gonna we're gonna go in front of him, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna tell him, you know, what occurred, how it occurred, and then 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 I'm going back to work. But but I'm not gonna go fix something for you. If I fix that, okay, then then my children believe that I can fix anything for them. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And I've told my children all the time, you don't tell nobody who your dad is. You don't tell nobody nothing. You know, you get pulled over by anybody, it's yes sir, no sir. And you treat him with respect, you know, and, 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 you know, that's, that's the, that's the way, you know, I don't have perfect kids. Uh Okay. But the one thing they knew was that we weren't going to try to sweep something under the carpet. And, and that's what I tell our players all the time. Don't come back here and believe that we're going to sweep something under the carpet. I mean, we're just not gonna, because you're going to have to be accountable for, 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 for what you did. And to me, when you can teach them accountability, they can then go on with their life, and then, then then she can start teaching it to her child. You see, that's her child that didn't shake a hand, right? Mm-hmm. Well, he's he's being held accountable for that at nine years old. And, and, and that's because, you know, she was held accountable. She told me this morning on the phone, she said, I need to send him a week and you do to him what you did to me. <laughs> you follow me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but, but you, 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 without accountability, man, if you let him go to the cookie jar – and you tell them don't go again, they go again. You tell them don't go again, they go again. You tell them don't go again, they go again. I- I'm just telling you, you know, it's it's not going to work out. Yeah, you're not you're not going to break that cycle. You're not going to break the that. chain. Hey, yeah. stop that! Time out. Five minutes. Time out. Well, uh, and I tell I tell parents this all the time. You know, if your child has two ways to go home from school, right, and one alley's got a Doberman in it, and the other alley, uh, um, alley has a little poodle in it. Which yeah, route? I, I ain't going in the Doberman route. Which, which route are you going home every day? <laughs> You follow me? Yeah, no, that's a good that's a good point. And I'm glad you brought up uh, the way you handle your players because it's something that I've always admired you for in the way you run your program because not everyone does this. You have your players sign a contract yes. when they come in, and when they violate that contract, they are punished they properly. Account. They know about it beforehand, yep. so it's, it's, yep. it's an agreement they've made. When did, you, when did you put that contract into place, and what kind of gave you the idea to do that? Well, I, it's been with me my whole career as coaching because – we, we we want them to make sure that they prove to us that they're not just attaching themselves to something that's elite. See, every every pro ball player that gets drafted, he might sign with one of the major league baseball teams. He thinks it's an honor. But but if he gets traded to the to the Yankees, he'll stand up always and say it's an honor and a privilege to wear the pinstripes, right? Well, why is it an honor and a privilege? Because of the people that once wore it. Okay? They they try not to let it get cheapened. And so the first day, you can talk to our players. You know, we put a roll of toilet paper up on the, 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 the podium and a jersey. 
and we explain to them, this is what you go to the bathroom, you know what you do with toilet paper, but you never, you know, do that with this jersey. Never. And because if I let them do that with that jersey, then it cheapens the jersey. You follow me? Mm -hmm. And so, but but you got to understand, some people are here to just attach themselves to something that's already been built. They don't, they don't want to uphold it. And so we, we have a contract in there for, you know, steroids, drugs, arrests, DWI, uh, all the things I think that's the, your biggest challenge in college. And what we want them to understand, a copy goes home to their parents so that it doesn't prevent amnesia, you know, because I've had a red shirt before. Say, well, coach, I didn't know, you know, I was red shirted. No, 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 that's not how we play this here. Nope, you know, nope. you're part of the program, you're part of the program. And so a lot of coaches always tell me, man, you're not in fear of that. I mean, why? I mean, it's to help give value to them. Like I tell them all the time, if you get arrested three times and get three DWIs and you still you get to play and when you finish, who's going to hire you? No one. I mean, there's going to be some issues there, right? Well, what I want to try to do with them in three to four years is turn them out with value, you know? And you would be surprised how many companies here in town call us because they've been through all of that, you know? Jeffrey Stafford told me one time when he sat down for his job in human resource, the guy said, hey, first talk to me about the contract that you've been under. And, and, and you know, they, they already know that some of this has been taken care of. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, their social contract. Exactly. And, 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 and it's also to, to, to make sure that they keep the university as a privilege because you'll also tear your university down because every time we get in trouble – we got to we got to suffer through the paper and suffer the university Mug suffers. Shots and, oh, yeah. and everything. And man, you beat up your university. You're supposed to be working for your university, you know. I mean, and so it, it's 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 there to try to help us, you know. In, in in Louisiana, you know, you know this, and especially our city, it's so much the culture, is so much around food and fun and yeah. drinking at an early age, and there's alcohol is very prevalent and everything else. I also have to put it in place to try to help the kid too because a 17, 18 year old kid will come into here and get in the city of Lafayette. I can do what? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, and, and uh, so it, it's, it's to try to make sure that we save them. Like I tell them all the time, you know, it's not bad to drink a beer or have a glass of wine. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is we don't want you to get arrested. We, we don't want you to, to do something that defaces you, your family, or the university, and then do something long enough that turns into not just drinking a beer but not glorifying alcohol. And that's what I want to try to get them stronger than is to make sure that they know who to glorify and not to try to glorify something that's not going to give them any return. Yeah. And uh, um, I'm, I'm going to ask you real quick just about, about your sons and, and your family. You talked a little bit about your daughter. Uh, what have you tried to teach your sons about how to be a tough man and a tough man and, and when to stand your ground? Because what I've seen is – when you draw a line, that line has to stay there. That yeah. you can't you can't no. mess where that no. line stands. Sure. And what how have you tried to kind of prepare your sons and your children for the next step, raising their own kids? Well, the biggest thing that we tried to do, again, we're not perfect parents. Uh there's no perfect parents. Um, there's no perfect clubhouse, there's no perfect job, there's no perfect marriage. You have to be willing to be able to handle um the conflict that comes within being married. You have to handle the conflict that comes within raising children. If you can't handle conflict, you're not going to stay married because uh, you're not going to get rid of the conflict in the marriage. I mean, it's just there's no perfect marriage. You're not going to yeah. get rid of the conflict in raising kids because there's going to be conflict every day. What you've got to get good at is handling conflict. I mean, I think that's, again, I always reserve back, revert back to the Navy SEALs. They teach them not how to get rid of conflict. They teach them how to be great during conflict. And, and, and I think that's the whole key. A lot of people try to get conflict out of their life and to try to have a perfect life, and there's no such thing. I mean, you, you got to get good at handling conflict. And so the way to, to me, the way to do it is really simple in the sense that the same thing we do with our players is, you, 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 number one, you clear with them about the rules. Clear. From there, draw your line and make sure that it's unapproachable. And when they do approach it, because they're going to test you, you're going to have to be prepared. And once you do it enough, the line stays clearly drawn in the sand. But if you start to, like you said, you know, scribble it out and then move it. Well, not this time. Out, I yeah. guess I'll change it this time. Yes, and move it. Then, then, then I think, I think you're going to be in trouble. You know, and it, and it's and it's hard 
being the jerk all the time. I mean, you know, we have a little cafeteria we set up in one of the trailers before the game, you know, for our players, and they're not allowed to come in and eat with flip-flops on, you know, and one player came in one day, so I told him go head back to the locker room, change. So he goes change, and, you know, a little while later, you know, another player walks in, and, you know, you can turn your head to it and get tired, but if you let him do it and you just told him he couldn't do it, that's not fair. So I told him, you got to go back to the clubhouse because so-and-so had to go back to the clubhouse. And I think once you draw your lines, you got you got to keep them drawn. Um, you know, our, our DWI rule is a year suspension, and when it happened this year, you can't go, I feel sorry for him, or he's a senior, this this is it for him, or not. Hey, the line was clear, you know, you know. But, but I tell you what I respect so much about this kid and his family, though, is that somebody, he has a class, and in his class, I guess, uh, he has an instructor that might know some law or something, and so the teacher pulls him up after and says, hey, look, if you need any help or whatever, you know, I don't know if they can really do this or whatever the case may be, you know. And so the kid said, no, that's okay. Uh, coach didn't do anything to me. He said, I did it to me. He said, so me and my family are going to take the consequences. And, man, he, he's grown so much just from that and his parents I respect so much because – they didn't come in and go, you know what we're going to do? We're going to pull him out let him go to a junior college. We're going to pull him out. We're going to go to an AI school. You know, they didn't run. They said, you're going to have to take care of it. And, you know, I told the boys that. I sat my wife down when they decided to play for me. I didn't make them play for me. I let them be recruited. They came to me and said, I want to stay and play. I said, okay, well, here's the parameters. You're going to have to sign a contract. And I said, Colleen, I don't want all my stuff packed on the side of the street because if one of them gets a DWI, I said, you know, they're suspended for a year. And they're not going to leave and go to no junior college. They're not going to leave and go to no NAI school. They're going to stay here, and they're going to walk through what they did. So so I, wanna, I want them to learn how to be a man because that's what he's going to have to live on, you know. Uh, Austin's getting married now. He's engaged to Sarah Maskowski, one of our volleyball players, December 31st. When he walks out of there, man, he, he, he look, his curveball or a slider is not going to help his marriage. I mean, it's not. He's going to have to man up now, you know, and be there for her. And, 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 and so, so those are the things, those are, why, those are why we have the parameters in ultimately. Yeah, they're tough, but it's also to help, um, you know, turn them into a man. Because, again, in sport, you got to be careful. Uh, a lot of times they want to be the man because that's what sport wants you to do is to be the man. I don't really want them to be the man. I just want them to be a man. Yep. And one last one for you, and we, we will probably have to finish this one off at a later date during the summer because I have a feeling you have a lot of thoughts about this one. And it has to do with your sport uh-huh. uh, and sport in general, athletics. There's been a large growing culture of professionalized youth sports, whether that's AAU basketball, you have the IMG Academy in Florida for football now where it's like a boarding school a laboratory where you send kids off. And ultimately what, I, what it's done is it's created this culture where the kid feels like they're a game changer no matter where they go. I'm an MVP. I'm the best player. I've been playing travel ball my whole life. Sure. And I feel like that, that right there is something that's really hard to break. It's really hard to break. Well, it's a tough message, you know, because, again, you know, it's because the, 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 the big appetite for, the, for our society today that glorifies athletics and uh, because it's also turned into a big business. I'm okay with all that, okay? What, what, what I'm for is just make sure you bring up the other side. Uh, if, if the IMG Academy would also have a class on leadership, if the IMG Academy would also teach him how to handle his glory once he's going to get it, that's my only problem with all of this is they, they, they search to go get all of this, but then they don't prepare them for when they run into the glory. You know, um, again, like Tiger Woods, his golf game didn't get him in trouble. So, so very rarely, you know, will your sport get you in trouble, but who you are as a man will always probably get you in trouble. And the only thing I want to see, you know, more coaches do, and look, they are, there's a move for it. I mean, you know, there's a big move for it. You know, we had a, uh, a, a thing here in town with Louis Cook and a bunch of some coaches, uh, co- head coach, football coach with Terlings was there and that and trying to bring, you know, Christianity in, into sport, you know, and trying to do the right thing while we handle these kids and uh, how to turn them into men. And so um, I, I think I think that's the only part that's missing. And then the compete part of it we're missing because what happens along the way, 
like today with USA and, and, and the way select baseball works, a kid can go to two games at Disney World and lose both games on Friday and go to Waterworld. <laughs> and then he can lose two games on Saturday and go to the zoo. And then Sunday he loses a game and he goes to see Mickey Mouse and Goofy. He comes home on Monday and somebody asks him, how'd you do this weekend? He said, he utters the words, I had a great weekend. Now he went 0-5. And, and then when we lose a game that we shouldn't, to, shouldn't lose to somebody, you know, my team's waiting down there for me to take them to the zoo or Waterworld. I mean, we're not going to the zoo or Waterworld, you know. But 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 that's that's also it's guaranteed gains, you know. If you lose two, you get rebracketed. If you lose two more, you get rebracketed. And then you know, mommy's running down there with with you know, like I said before, you know, a Powerade or something in the second inning, and he has water in the in the dugout, you know. Uh, let him let him let him work through all that. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And and um, so so you know, it's like we made the statement that day. You know, we're looking for players that drink through the water holes. It went viral, you know, yeah. and. So I had this. I got so much stuff sent back to me. I got this one little boy. It's pretty cool. He's holding up two trophies, and he's got a water hose hanging around his neck. You know, I've seen got so many videos of kids sent send me videos out in their yard drinking out of the water hose. You know, I mean, but but the statement we made was, you know, back off a little bit. You know, and 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 let them play, and just let them, and just just make sure you teach the game on how it can build them as a man. If we could just do that, I'm telling you, sport is one of the greatest uh, microcosms of, of, of society. It's, it's, it's a great opportunity to, to teach him so much, but we, 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 we forget about that when, when we're trying to win, and I think that's what you got to balance. Yep. Head coach Tony Robichaud of the Raging Cajun Baseball Program has been our guest for another edition of Making a Man. Coach, now I'm thirsty. I need to go drink from the hose. There you go. Let's do it. All right, Coach, I might have to have you back on again during the summer, but I can't thank you enough.